Good day, everyone. Thank you for coming to today's Folio Forum, which is sponsored by the Open Library Environment in partnership with EBSCO and Index Data. My name is Peter Murray. I am the open source community advocate uh, for Index Data. And the host for today's event. Our topic today is how to invent things that meet challenges in libraries. Today's session, like all Folio forums, is being recorded and will be posted to the Open Library Environment website. Uh, as an open forum, participants can see each other and all questions submitted. And we've muted everyone except for the speakers to ensure good sound quality. Uh, use the question box within Zoom to enter questions and comments as they come to you. We're going to uh, try something new with this forum, uh, and that is to invite speakers to ask their questions uh, or invite uh, uh, attendees to ask their questions directly to our speaker. Uh, ask the question uh, in the question box, and as you do so, Please also let us know if you have a microphone on your computer and are willing to ask your question directly. Our speaker will address questions throughout the presentation. So as those questions come to you, uh, do put them in the Q&A box. Uh, if you like to tweet, uh, please use the Twitter hashtag Folio Forum. Uh, we also uh, encourage you to continue the conversation on this topic on the Folio Discussion website, discuss.folio.org. Our speaker today is Philip Jacobson, uh, the founder of his user experience firm, uh, Samheg, and he's also the lead user experience designer for the Folio project. Uh, Philip, take it away. Thanks, Peter. Um, it tells me I can't start my video. I'm not sure if someone can do something about that. I noticed that as well, and we have our tech support behind the team uh, looking at that. So uh, as the uh, presentation goes on, we'll, uh, we'll let you know about that. Okay. Um, so I'll just try to share my screen then. Yeah. All right. Can you guys see? Uh, uh, rhinoceros and some some text. We can see it. Yes, thank you. All right. So, yeah, I mean, the ti I titled this talk uh, "How to Invent Things That Meet Challenges in Libraries," <clears throat> um, and that's what I'm going to talk about. And it's going to be quite um, down to earth, so to speak. Um, and it's it's more an inspiration for everyone to sort of take away some ideas for how you could think about innovating and, and coming up with new ideas by using some design methods rather than being you know like a, a specific one correct way of doing things uh, and a lot of what I present I hope that's assumed but it's not invented by me it's uh, general design principles that are used by a lot of people um, and the premise for this process, the whole process and all the steps, is that uh, people shouldn't be afraid to ask stupid questions. Um, right, so I think I'm just going to dive into it, um, starting with step one, which is spotting problems. So we're going to go through uh, seven steps, uh, starting from figuring out what needs to be, what problem needs to be addressed, and then um, taking it from there on to creating a final uh, solution, or at least creating a uh, finished uh, prototype. So the first step is, st step is spotting a problem. And this is, of course, an easy step if, um, if you have something in your library that you know is a problem to your workflow or to your colleague's workflow. Um, but sometimes the problem isn't so um, obvious, or it might be you, that you can only find problems that you don't know what to do about or that that isn't really in your domain. So a pretty important part of the design process is just figuring out what is the, the problem that you that you want to solve. So what we do in the Folio project um, 
is we use a method called shadowing, which is basically uh, going out to libraries, talking to people, following them around, and see how see how they perform their work. And doing that, um, you often notice things that people themselves um, don't notice so much. That is, that could be uh, optimized in their workflow. And the same would be true if a librarian came to me and looked at me uh, designing stuff all day. They would notice, you know, when I get annoyed by stuff that that for some reason or other. Uh, the the person doing things don't always think about it because they you know we as humans we just tend to get used to things that that are um, you know we just find workarounds and especially uh, this is especially true in libraries I've found it, because people are quite um, resourceful and so whenever there's a problem people will just try to work around it and then that becomes the workflow and it, of course it's a challenge for the people who do make for example software because Oftentimes, they, um, there isn't so much pressure on them to actually optimize their, their products because people are so resourceful, they just find a way around it. It's a good thing, and it's also, um, it has a, a backside as well. So anyway, we, we, we uh, follow people around, and so if you're working in an institution where, let's say, you work with uh, just developing the discovery layer, or you work in tech services, and you want to find out, um, someone comes to you and says, you know, we, we feel like uh, this process in circulation or this process in acquisition is pretty slow. Uh, you can, of course, just take their word for it that whatever they tell you is, is, the, is the real problem and is the biggest problem in the process. Uh, but, and, and it might very well be. Um, it might also be that it's something else which you could figure out by following them uh, through their work. Uh, or even if what they say is actually the problem, what you could figure out by following them is figuring out some of the nuances of what they're saying, uh, because we aren't always aware of every detail of what we do uh, in, in our own work, because it's it's come so natural to us, because we do it so often, uh, that we don't always get all the details um, when, we when we try to describe it to someone else. So these are some snapshots from uh, a visit to the Royal Library in Sweden, where we used this method uh, and basically, yeah, followed them around, saw how they, they do some of the special things they do, which deal with uh, in-house um, reading room circulation uh, and updating a bunch of these uh, slips all the time, etc. And so this process gives insight into if you if you know that you're looking at a specific problem, but oftentimes it will also reveal reveal uh, challenges or p potential innovations that could be done in a particular area. Um, as I said when I started the talk, I mean it's going to be very down to earth. So the next method is just called asking around, uh, which basically sometimes you're not able to actually see how people perform their work, uh, and there might be various reasons for that, but um, often, I mean, sometimes people are really aware of, of the main problem with their work. And so just asking, asking questions and having a good conversation with people about um, what to improve is a, is a pretty good place to start. Um, if it's something in your own workflow, or if you try to impersonate someone else for a day and try to solve their tasks uh, for a while, uh, a really good method is just uh, allowing yourself to get really annoyed if something isn't working properly. If something is taking too long, you have to you know, run, run around between eight different departments or you have to click a thousand times to, to get a minor task done. Um, that's a pretty good starting point for, for optimizing something. Uh, oftentimes it just stops there, you get annoyed and then you get used to it. Um, but with the, the, with the following steps that I'm going to present, you'll be able to take that annoyance and turn it into an actual uh, idea for a product or a solution. Um, another sort of angle you can take on discovering challenges in the library um, is try to look at the big problems um, that you probably can't solve all at once at least. Uh, but you might be able to sort of uh, slice them up into into smaller pieces. So, 
a big problem, I suppose, would be, you know, people are using libraries less or people don't think the library is relevant sometimes or for some things or people just Google and they don't get into the depth of knowledge that is in the library. And we don't know how to to get them, uh, get them back or get them motivated. Or, or maybe we do, but, you know, the, the solutions we have will take a really long time to implement. So that's a really big problem or a really big challenge. And um, I don't think there is one solution that would just solve, solve that off the bat, uh, but it, it can inspire and, and we'll see that going forward in the process. It can inspire um, questions and ideas for parts of the, the problem that might be solved. Um, another way to, to look, to try to find a, a challenge to solve um, would be to look at small things. I mean, if you have a bunch of little problems, a bunch of places in your system where you have to click, uh, you know, too many times, or a bunch of uh, requests that come in regarding, uh, re you know, requests that p patrons placed or questions about where to find a particular item. And these are small things that one might think, you know, it's not always worth spending the time solving of uh, small problems like that compared to how long it would take to, to um, yeah, so compared to how long you would have to spend on it. Um, but sometimes you can discover patterns in these small problems that you can then sort of um, solve with one bigger uh, innovation. Right. Oh, and now I can turn my camera on. There you go, yes. All right. Um, right. Let's see if I can get back here. Right. Um, so, when you found the problem uh, to solve, uh, you might not have found the problem to solve. And uh, obviously that sounds very uh, counterintuitive, but uh, sometimes as with our cute little rhinoceros here, uh, who finds leaves that are being torn apart, uh, the problem isn't, the root of the problem isn't really the leaves, like trying to fix those wouldn't really solve anything, which is obvious to us because it's a known problem and um, we have known solutions for that, but it isn't like that in real life when we encounter new things. So finding the cause of the problem is really the next step in the, in the design process. And so a good, a good method for this that's used by a lot of creators around the world is just being really annoying basically and, and just keep asking the question why, you know, like kids do sometimes, um, you know, why is the sky blue? Well, you know, because such and such, well, why? You know, and then it just continues. Um, and that can often be a good, um, a really good way to dig down to the root of the problem. And I know it sounds banal. Actually, most of the stuff I'm presenting sounds banal, but uh, the fact of the, or my, in my experience, a lot of these sort of uh, the things that I present, they aren't really being, like we don't practice them because when we're busy with our jobs, we just don't, I mean, take the time to, to take a step back and ask these sometimes silly sounding questions. Um, so imagine that you have a problem in your library um, where people leave their books in the wrong place rather than putting in, them in the, the place where they're supposed to be checked in. I mean, that's a problem. So of course, if you stop there and you say, let's solve this problem, you'd put up a uh, post reminding people to put them in the right place or do something else. Um, but if you then, you know, ask why do they leave it? Let's say they leave them in a specific place uh, near the door. Well, why do they do that? Well, because someone placed a table right next to the entrance door and for some reason that's more convenient for people. And then you would have to ask, well, why did someone place a table there? Does it serve any purpose? And then maybe it's used for something else, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so this isn't an example that, that could be solved by a piece of software. It's just something uh, that has to do with interior design, I suppose. But these principles aren't really limited to designing software. They would work for a, a wide variety of uh, different purposes. So again, um, asking, asking why a bunch of, of times would get you closer to the root of the problem. Uh, talking to, if you yourself are an experienced person in the area, 
in question. Uh, you'd know something yourself, but otherwise you could talk to other experienced people, ask them for advice. Um, that's always useful. Uh, read books, studies, etc. Um, like these things are common knowledge, I think, but I think it's good to just reiterate them. Um, and so having found a problem and figured out what the root cause of it is uh, brings you to the one of the more interesting steps, perhaps, uh, if you're if you like uh, coming up with ideas. And so the next step uh, is called simply uh, write down your ideas. And um, it's basically just coming up with as many crazy ideas as you can to solve the problem uh, at hand. And so there's, there's sort of a, some rules to follow when you do this and a premise for, for it to produce a good outcome. And the first rule is that you can't say no. You can never say no in this sort of uh, ideation phase. Um, and so it doesn't mean that you can't be critical and realistic later on. It just means right now in this phase, don't say no. So if you're, you know, coming up with ideas by yourself, don't stop yourself thinking, oh, this idea is stupid, or this probably, we don't have the budget for this, or this, someone already tried this five years ago and it didn't work. Uh, just write down all the good ideas and all the bad ideas, just all the ideas, get them out. Um, even the crazy ones, that's the first rule. The second rule is basically the same thing. Don't ever say no. If someone says, you know, let's make flying monkeys sort the books in the library, don't say no, just say yes. You know, we give them robot arms and they can sort all the books in no time. And I, and I know this sounds silly if you're a rational human being uh, and that's okay. Uh, that's That just proves that you are, you are of a sound mind. Um, but the, um, the purpose of not saying no in this phase is that even though the crazy ideas won't bring you anywhere uh, directly. Indirectly, they oftentimes spark ideas that, uh, that can actually be used for something. So if someone talks about flying monkeys, that's, that's probably not a very uh, reasonable thing to try to make happen in your library. It will probably be fun, but not very realistic. Um, but it might cause some, one of the other people you're brainstorming with to think, you know, what if we had drones flying around sorting the books or, you know, taking it a step closer to reality. Um, and so in that way, it's basically just a way to free your mind of, of all, the, uh, all the wisdom that you've acquired over a lifetime, telling you, you know, the fastest way to get from A to B. And that's a good thing if you're, if you're in a hurry and you need to go somewhere, uh, literally or metaphoric, metaphorically, but, um, in the creative process, it can also be a hindrance because you oftentimes just don't take the time to consider um, the crazy things. So a friend of mine told me that uh, apparently in, when you do improv, you're ne also not allowed to say no. You're only allowed to say yes. And so that, that rule applies when you're brainstorming as well. So if you sit down with someone to come up with ideas, uh, it, no matter what they say, you can't say no either. Yeah, yeah, you can. You just say yes, and and then you build on whatever they're doing. Because even though it takes some crazy directions, it it, it oftentimes comes back to something that that's actually really useful. Um, so some people say the best way to get a good idea is to get lots of ideas, and that's not uh, entirely. I can't say that it's not true. It's definitely a pretty good um, premise as a as a as a way to start thinking about this stuff. Um, so a few methods to start getting these lots of ideas so that you can get the good idea is uh, brainstorming. And I call it here brainstorming plus just because I know that the way that I'm doing uh, these uh, processes and, and that we're doing them in this project might not live up to the textbook definition. So I just don't want anyone to blame me for, for teaching you something wrong in terms of what brainstorming is. Uh, but the way that we use it is basically getting a bunch of people who know about the problem or who at least would have the, the sort of the premise, uh, the prerequisite for understanding the problem in a room together and then just, um, you know, get, get a bunch of post-its or get a whiteboard uh, with, with some pens and then ask people to write down all the potential ways that you could solve this problem. And uh, 
any sort of side effects of the problem that could be solved or any you know uh, underlying problems that could be solved that could affect uh, this problem and so it's very simple that's basically what you do and then what will oftentimes happen is you'll get these clusters of ideas that center around the same concepts um, and sorting them those out will oftentimes you know if you put them in categories like I've shown here on the right um, it will sort of give you a, a feeling of where to where to go next so you don't have the solution at this point you just have a bunch of realistic or unreal uh, unrealistic ideas um, but when you get to the next stage of the process this is going to be highly useful to you um, another way to do it is uh, mind mapping plus again I'm not sure this is the, the, the textbook uh, way to do it but this is uh, has proved quite useful in our work um, and so here I just you start basically writing a problem on a, on a whiteboard for example uh, or on a piece of paper it doesn't really matter uh, but it's it's nice to have something that everyone can see especially if you are more people in the room so the problem here would be hungry ants eating are uh, eating plants in the in the garden or hungry ants in the garden and so here's a great demonstration of some of the crazy craziness leading to some less crazy thoughts so from this bubble basically people just shout out anything they think of could be ideas it could be yeah that's basically it um, and so the point of this exercise is to get everyone sort of uh, creative thought flow going um, and that means that some of the stuff on this diagram is absolutely insane and that's okay because it just sort of people can snap out of uh, reality for a moment and then come back when it's time to to um, to create an actual solution so hungry ants in the garden as a solution might be seal the garden off and because Bob said seal the garden off then Jim said you know, he thought of a ceiling because seal sounds like ceiling and someone shouts out invite the Navy seals to deal with it and someone says you know put a seal in the pool in the garden which d doesn't even make any sense but and that's okay uh, that's perfectly okay in this phase um, and then someone says seal off the holes in the garden wall by the kitchen that's how they get in and so maybe he's the only guy who noticed this and that's actually a practical um, practical solution that might not have come about if other people weren't shouting about Navy SEALs and whatnot um, and then you have one of the other bubbles here that says make it an attraction for visit visitors watch the plants get eaten alive could be the sort of the sales point um, and um, yeah again that's a, a ridiculous notion but remember you're not allowed to say no at this stage so someone else says well you could invite visitors to come up with ideas to solve the problem as they're watching the the ants eat and then someone else says you know just disinvite all the visitors we won't have visitors anymore and someone else says close the library and then we get to something more realistic like maybe we could close the library off for a while to deal with it or close off a part of the library at a time etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, and so this is obviously an example I wrote from this uh, rhinoceros that an illustrator did to, to illustrate this uh, general process so it's not very applicable in in reality um, but I think you get the gist of it um, even though it's sort of a, a silly little example and um, yeah and, this, and like I said the silly parts of this it's okay that, that they're like that and I know we've all been taught uh, to be producing any uh, outcome but um, as long as everyone is aware that this is part of the process uh, then it's actually a really good way to sort of have fun of course but also to uh, to get to to think some different thoughts than you would do usually another method to use uh, which is um, some say this is sort of the basis for creativity when you come up with something you you mo yeah most inventions are really you know combinations of concepts that already exist um, and so there might be uh, 
technical innovation and new things to actually do things. But in, in concept, most of the things, at least I can think of, are, you know, are a mix of, of two other things or two other concepts that already exist. And so on a conceptual level, it's a really good thing to just work with combination. And so here I, I show it with some shapes, a square and a triangle could form a house or a repeat button or a lion. Um, and so, but if you do it with concepts, so you have, um, and these concepts would be something that comes out of the problem definition phase where now I just put in a bunch of stuff. Uh, and then you have the chance to combine it with something in the library. But if the problem definition had been about um, plants, you might have, you know, uh, pesticides and animals and plants and garden and whatever, and combine it with uh, other things. Um, so in this case, looking at, at these bubbles, let's say YouTube and millennials and Spotify and global warming and fact checking, I just put in a bunch of stuff. Uh, that are non-library related and a bunch of stuff that is library related, related. If one wanted to just come up with ideas for stuff that could be done in the library space, this would be a way to do it. So I was actually hoping that somehow people um, would be able to join, to chime in on this quick brainstorming, but I'm not sure the technology allows it. So I think I'll, I'll just finish the presentation and then see if we can do something like that. Sort of a co uh, shared exercise. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I didn't prepare anything for this, but just looking at it, thinking like if you combine any one of these uh, with another, so Spotify and metadata management, for example, well, you know, could the library manage the metadata for all the songs from Spotify? Or could this somehow be sucked into the library system and be joined up with the records that you have for that. Or could you do it the, the other way around, like where you get metadata on demand and that doesn't even make sense and that's okay. Uh, but uh, if you take fake news and mix with the circulation, could you do something where um, you make the system suggest um, items to circulate that counteract any relevant fake news stories in the press or, or in the, on social media or whatever. Um, yeah, and this is all just stuff I'm coming up with as I speak. So there is nothing um, thought through about it, but the basic notion I hope you get, which is that by using combination as a tool uh, and as a method, you can very quickly come up with some ideas and most of them will be very silly probably, uh, but but usually it, it, uh, it yields some good results, either as a result of being inspired by the crazy ideas um, or, or directly because you think that uh, you could do something interesting being inspired by what Netflix does in terms of licenses or something else. Um, this really makes a lot more sense when you sort of do examples. So um, let's see if we can do something like that at the end of the, at the, end of the talk. Um, and other uh, method that sounds quite lazy is um, basically just sleep on it or do something else. So when you, after you get into the problem and you get into, uh, maybe you didn't start generating ideas yet, or maybe you, you started and you sort of got stuck, just leave it. I mean, leave, leave the process or get some sleep, do something else because your subconscious is still gonna be working on it uh, in the background. Um, so sometimes, you know, when you have, when you have that uh, brilliant idea all of a sudden for some kind of thing that you've been thinking about, um, obviously your, your mind has been working on it without you consciously putting effort into it. Um, and, uh, it's also a great way to just re, re, refill your batteries to get back with a renewed energy. So it's another, other little tip. So once you've done this and you've come up with all these uh, crazy and not so crazy ideas through brainstorming or mind mapping or both or combining, you know, services or solutions, you know, from outside of the library with things, problems that you have in the library. Um, then you're ready to go through those ideas and hopefully your desk looks something like this uh, or your whiteboard or wherever you store these ideas. So you'll have a bunch of them. 
and then you can basically do it yourself or, or with with a colleague but you go through the ideas and, and sort of discuss which would actually be feasible and which would work um, and then you you pick a solution um, and then these methods can sort of help you turn that uh, or you pick an, an idea sorry and then um, each idea could probably be implemented in a, in a variety of different ways. Um, and so you can take a few ideas or you can take one idea and then run, run this process for, for each of them and see, uh, you know, which ideas sort of make sense. Oftentimes when you start do, using these um, methods to sketch out a solution, as I call it, um, you get to a point where you can sort of sense if it makes sense, if, it, if it's a reasonable thing to proceed with or not. And oftentimes you just drop the, drop the idea uh, after, not, after a short while, but um, some of the ideas will probably resonate once you start sketching them out. So one way to do this is to do what we've done a few times in Folio, is to get some clever people in a room and, uh, and at this point you have a problem uh, the ants are eating the plants, and you have a potential idea for a solution. Our rhinoceros friend here has a, wants to use a, um, a melon to kind of distract the ants, I think. And um, and so that's that's the idea apparently in this case. Uh, or let's say um, let's say the problem is the thing with the patrons leaving the books by the door rather than in the check-in counter. Um, then that's the problem and then you have the idea that well let's put big arrows on the floor that lead to the check-in counter that will, should increase the number of people who leave them in the right spot. Um, and then at the, or, the, or the idea may be just you know lead people to the check-in counter and then either yourself or with a bunch of people you, you, you get together and you just sort of start mapping out what that experience should look like. And so um, for, let, for a software tool, this is highly useful because oftentimes, even if you're not a UI designer, you can sort of quickly uh, um, articulate what, what you want that software tool to do. Um, so if it's a tool that helps you automatically uh, order a book from Amazon within your library system, then um, a, um, then this process of taking each step basically and putting it on post-its, um, uh, you don't see it so well here, but the idea behind this process is basically taking each step and writing it as a post-it and underneath you sort of have the sub-steps. So if, if the idea is, you know, let's, order books from Amazon directly through the library system, then the first step might be, you know, pick book. And the next one would be uh, order book. And the next one would be choose uh, shipping details. And then under that, you'd have the details, you know, when you pick the book, which edition do you want? And where do you want it sent from? Et cetera, et cetera. And so you sort of get this overview of, um, of what the system needs to do and having that um, in place is then not really a, a design for a product, but it's the basis for you to use one of the other methods um, I'll talk about to sort of sketch out um, what your idea or app or prototype needs to do. And so uh, this is a screenshot from the process we had for working with the resource management apps for Folio um, after having done it in person on post-its, we turned it into a spreadsheet, mimicking the, the look of the post-its. And then we had a, and we were able to have a discussion online with people being in different locations about what is actually the, the optimal way to have this system uh, work, what should be the flows, et cetera. Um, I like to, for some reason, my brain likes to see things in a more visual way. Um, so I oftentimes do the same sort of process, but in this diagram way and there, there's a multitude of ways to do it. So there isn't really one correct way, way to do it, but basically just breaking down things into their uh, components is, um, is a good way to get closer to what it is you're actually trying to do. So in this case, um, 
it's as you know, review budget, and then you have fiscal year rollover, uh, roll continuing resources, funds to new fiscal year, et cetera. So you have sort of all the steps, and then for some of them, I start splitting it up into what should be v V1 or V2, uh, based on the, it's the same information that you have in this sort of diagram, where you have uh, the, the, the different details that you need to go through in the system, and then you, you have the um, versions in a horizontal, sorry, in a vertical manner. So this is for V1, and the next functionality down here is for V2, but you can still see which sort of step in the process it's associated with. Um, another method that we use is what I like to call ugly sketching, uh, just to, to clarify that it's not meant to be a work of art. Uh, it's just meant to communicate an idea. And so it's on a level where most people, wh whether you think you're good at drawing or not, uh, can, can sort of participate and get their ideas across. And so, um, here I just came up with an example when doing this presentation, which is, you know, let's, let's imagine someone wanted to create a um, Chrome plugin that whenever you're on a website, a blog or a bookstore, um, you could install this plugin and then there would be a button in the browser that checks if this book is available in the library uh, to sort of encourage people to, to use the library rather than buying books. And so that can, that can be communicated in as ugly a sketch as the one I've made here. Um, and I think the point gets across. And so if you can do something like this, it doesn't even, it can even be worse than this, I think, uh, then you're good to go. You can design uh, a, a basic um, solution for, for whatever problem you're looking at uh, in terms of software. And if it's, if it's a spatial sort of thing you're trying to do, uh, you, you can probably draw, draw a floor plan, floor plan in, uh, in the equal amount of detail to what we have here. And so we use this a lot. If you've seen any of the talks we've been doing on um, discussing resource management, uh, I do a bunch of these different little ugly sketches for different functionality. And the good thing is it doesn't take long to do the actual sketches. The, the, coming up with the ideas takes a while. Uh, but the sketches don't take long, and so that means I don't spend a lot of time on the sketches, and that also means that people aren't afraid to criticize or to critique or to give advice on how to make them better because it's sort of like if you cook a, a dinner for someone and you spend three hours on it and then you ask them, how does it taste? Most people will be polite enough to say it's, it's good no matter how it actually tastes, whereas if you just whip something, you know, put something in the microwave and hand it to them, and ask how it tastes them. There's a bigger chance they, they're willing to give their honest opinion. And sort of the same here, that if you come show something to people when you have to test it, which is the next part of the process, um, then um, if it looks really beautiful and finished, then people will assume you spend a lot of time on it and they'll sort of be afraid to tell you what they really think. Whereas if you show them something that you obviously didn't put a lot of effort into, you know, polishing, then um, they'll be more likely to, to say their honest opinion. Um, right, so we use that a lot. Yeah, so sort of taking this a step further, this, these sorts of ugly sketches is you can, what you can do is you can make a bunch of little ugly sketches on different pieces of paper, uh, and you can combine them with post-its and whatnot if you don't want to, you know, if you just want to draw a certain part of the interface, for example, once and reuse it on different screens, you just draw it on a post-it that you can move from paper to paper. Um, and then you could basically sit down with someone and hand them the interface, the program, uh, the app that you design, um, and have them sort of click on the paper. And when they click on a button on a piece of paper, then you hand them the appropriate piece of paper that they, the appropriate screen that they would be taken to um, by clicking on that button. And so it's sort of like an interactive prototype on a screen, except you don't have to know any software and you don't have to spend time drawing it digitally. You can just you know spend 15 minutes doing a bunch of post-it notes and papers and then uh, test out if that solution sort of uh, makes sense with uh, with people to to other people and you can do the same for um 
for digital prototypes, uh, it's it's the, exactly the same concept. You build up sort of a layout, and then you can link the different screens that you have in your layout by when to different buttons and stuff in the interface. It's sort of like an advanced PowerPoint uh, presentation, and we use it a lot in in Folio. I can just try and open up the prototype setup we have. So here we set up uh, a little little prototype. Uh, tool where you can sort of uh, switch between different apps um, and then, you know, uh, see uh, what in information they contain. In some of the apps you can do uh, interactive stuff, in some of them uh, it's more static. If we take this one, for example, um, you can actually get pretty close when you do these digital prototypes to the, to the real program that you want to build or this the user experience without having to code. Um, so in this case, it's an app where you can sort of put together workflows. And when you pull these, you can pull these boxes around and then they expand when you do that. Uh, and you can switch between different views to, um, to get these different boxes that you can pull in. And so it's not super smooth and it's not perfect, uh, but it gives you sort of the sense of what is it actually this pro app is supposed to do. And so I'm not getting into detail with the process of actually creating these prototypes here um, um, because the focus right for this talk is, is, on, um, is on the ideation and problem solving phase. Um, but I mean, there are hundreds of tutorials out there on how to use these tools. And um, you can, of course, write to me if you have any questions or uh, need any advice on how to approach that. So, you know, when you know your problem and you have a bunch of ideas and potentially you, you try to map it out using this uh, user story mapping, uh, one shape or, or another, um, then you know what functionality you need. And then it's a matter of knowing a few sort of interface principles to make you to, to enable you to put together something like this, if it's a if it's a software tool you're building, it might be something else. And I don't really do. I do UX user experience for software um, platforms and, and frameworks and apps. Um, but I thought I would just include um, a an example of what a prototype could look like for a physical product. So this is the company IDEO, who. Um, who does uh, also different types of other design consultancy. And so in this case, they were hired to do, to develop a tool for, a, uh, sorry, a toy for a, a, a toy maker, some kind of company doing toys. Uh, I guess it's like a, a pony or something. Uh, and so they have this video where they show sort of going from what you look at here to the final product. And they're basically trying to figure out the mechanics of if you put this horse on a hill, then it can move around a little bit um, because the legs are, um, they are on a, on a hinge. Um, and so this seems kind of childish. I mean, it seems like something, you know, a sixth grader put together and the same is true for these types of uh, sketches and that's totally okay. I mean, it's not supposed to be pretty. It's just supposed to communicate sort of the, the core the essence of what it is you're trying to build. Um, and so if you leave this talk with anything, it should be that uh, you shouldn't be afraid to make mistakes in all of these, in, in this whole design process. If, if this is your result, then you're on a, then you're on a professional level because these guys are, um, are doing this for a living and I'm doing this for a living and this is sort of the stuff I, I do. So, I mean, the bar is pretty low in terms of uh, how artistic you have to be. Uh, you just need a you know uh, a good brain to to figure out how to solve the problems. If you if you want to do something for Folio, which is a modular software system, then knowing the different app types that we have in Folio is helpful um, because it sort of tells you how much work you have to put into it. And so you could either create an app like the workflows app that we look here, where you have a full sort of UI that's uh, built exactly how you want it. But it could also be a smaller app like the Files app you see here where you, it sort of opens up in a little window. Um, and that's relevant if you're building something where people don't need to use the app so much. They just need to open it up a few times, maybe see a status. 
So let's say you're a sys, uh, like a tech, uh, tech services librarian, and you have some kind of service that people need to monitor for, you know, downtime or something. You could just make a popover app uh, that simply shows, you know, like a red or a green light or shows the log of what actions have been performed. Um, and uh, yeah, and that would be sufficient probably for what people would need to do with that app. Um, you might also not want to have any kind of UI at all, not no kind of user interface, just have something that runs under the hood. Uh, and that's, that's one thing that just you build something that has no graphical user interface, but you might also have something that almost doesn't have a graphical user interface where it has no user interface, but you still want to be able to set up some preferences for it. So an example in, in the current polio prototypes is uh, interface preferences, for example. Uh, that's, that's not an app in the system, but you can go in here and you can turn on and off high contrast colors and switch the color, color theme and so on. Um, and um, yeah, and the same is true for shortcuts. You don't have any app where you open up and, and use shortcuts in the app. It's something that happens sort of under the hood, but you need some place to set up the preferences for it. Um, and then we also have a uh, thing that, that I was just um, demonstrating, which is the workflows. Um, and let's see. Um, the way that works is basically you have um, a, a trigger and you have some, some steps that run when that trigger happens. So an item changes location, for example. When that happens, I, and then you put in some steps and the step could be, you know, create a task. And I want that task to be to Jane Doe, for example. Um, and so that, that's a workflow you could make. So if, if the, and we have a, an ongoing discussion on, on the discuss platform right now as to what we want these triggers and steps to be, uh, how, how complex and which tasks that you need to perform with them. So you can, you can chime in on that uh, debate um, or you can just follow it to see sort of where we are. And if, you, if, if the idea that you have can be solved simply by putting together triggers and steps, then that's great because it means that uh, your, the solution for your problem is probably closer than, than having to get a dev team together and develop a bunch of custom software. Um, it might also be that it's almost there, but what you need to make your solution happen in real life is just an extra trigger that listens to something that, that no one else has, uh, has done yet. Um, so let's say your workflow just really depends on the, on the system listening to a particular student information system. Uh, and so if, if you build a trigger that can listen to that, an API from that system, uh, and, then this, and then someone else provides sort of the workflow steps that you need to do, you need to create a task, or you need to sync some data, um, then that would be sufficient to sort of solve the problem at hand. Um, so we're gonna be putting out more information as to what these different types of solutions could look like and, and, and what is recommended for different use scenarios. Uh, but I just thought I would mention it now since it, uh, it's of course relevant for if you actually wanna do something for Folio. Um, so once you make your solution that could be you know, uh, it could be some sketches, it could be a prototype. If it's a physical thing, let's say you have a problem with the, uh, there's, a re there's been a reconstruction at the library, so the cards are too wide or too small, or you can't staple the books in the, in the right way. Um, then you might, you know, do a, a prototype rather than figuring out where to order a proper library card. You just bring in like a wheelbarrow or whatever. Um, the, it could be something on that level, on this level, or on this level. So you have your solution, and then it's time to test it. And so the best you could do is, of course, bring it to the users that would actually use it. Uh, and so the closer you can get to, not to the finished polished look and feel of the thing you're trying to make, but to sort of the logic and the functionality of it, the better, because then you could just hand it over to a user and then see how they use it, see if they use it in the right way, see if they click, you know, if it, is, if it behaves the way that they expect it to, uh, if they behave the way you expect them to with the new solution that you've set up in your prototype. 
Uh, someone says the sound is cutting. Um, let's see if it gets better. I don't know. Yeah, it's been okay here, Philip. Uh, and of course, we'll make the uh, recording available uh, after the fact. Okay. Um, so when you do this sort of, you can of course, the best thing is if you can hand them something or put them in a situation where they try the new solution and you can see if it works or not or how it works. Uh, but sometimes you, you, it would be too time consuming to create something where they can fully test it without any kind of help. So you might, you know, show them a sketch and explain what it's about and then one of the core things to be aware of in that situation is, you know, don't ask yes, no questions and don't ask leading questions. So don't ask like, do you like it? Or is this what, you know, what would work? Because it's something that could be answered with yes and no and you don't want the dialogue to end, you know, do you like it? Yes. Okay. Well, good talk. See you later. Because uh, no one really gets anything out of that. Because um, you don't know if they're saying that to be polite or if they actually it actually works for them. So the best thing is if they can test it, but sometimes you need to explain and have a dialogue, but then it's a good thing to use phrases like, you know, how might we make this better? Or do you have any advice for us? Or using how and why and what in your questions so that you're sort of encouraging people to explain what they think. And the same is, so it's the same trick that or trick. It's the same approach and method that reporters use when they want people to, in documentaries, to talk about something that has occurred. They don't ask questions that where they can answer yes or no often. Um, if they want, you know, someone doing a portrait of some someone, they want them to, to actually talk about it. Um, another method that you can use, you know, on your own or in a group, is. Um, to sort of first, you know, look at all the, the good things about the solution that you made and then write that down and then look at all the, like try to be um, in the, your own uh, sort of worst critic and look at all the bad things. Just write down all the, the bad things and be as negative as you can. And once you've done both of those, you're sort of in a good position to be more objective. Um, and to try and sort of assess what should be changed about the solution you've made and what shouldn't. Um, and, um, and so you can do this on your own um, or you can do it in a group and then everyone chime in with all the, the praise and all the criticism and then uh, discuss afterwards what to change. Um, and again, I mean, this isn't, um, it doesn't have to be super complex. Um, if you understand sort of the steps you have to go through, uh, having a conversation with someone without trying to force it into a particular pattern um, is also a really good way to just figure out if it makes sense what you've done. Uh, so what, what journalists do um, and or at least some journalists recommend and what uh, what also works well for this process is to have if you have sort of a solution and you want to discuss certain elements of it have some bullet points in your head or on a piece of paper um, and be aware of what you want to cover but don't sort of force the conversation to go your way and to, to cover all those points uh, if it starts flowing and people start talking about something else try to gently bring it back to the topic but don't all of a sudden you know cut them off and start asking about um, something else to the extent possible, of course. And so at this point, you've, you've had your, um, your, you found your problem, you've had a bunch of ideas, you sketched out one or more solutions, you sort of uh, talked to people about it, been critical yourself or with a group, you've sort of assessed if it makes sense. And so at this point, um, you, you're in a position to either decide to, to change things. Uh, so that's the part of this process where you're sort of being objective, uh, just looking at what you could, what you sh should probably change. Um, or find it as interesting as you hope they would. Um, then you might just scrap it and then go for one of the other ideas because obviously, having generated a bunch of ideas, uh, there will be, oftentimes there'll be more than one thing that would work. And so, um, and 
yeah, so either you sort of adapt it or you start on, on another idea. Um, and so if you find something that actually works, obviously uh, with a system like Folio in terms of software, you'd actually be able to share it as an app or as a workflow so other people literally can reuse what you've done. Uh, but even if it's not something that deals with Folio, uh, if you give a talk uh, in real life or online or you write a blog post or you just talk to your colleagues in your own institution and in other institutions, um, then um, they can benefit conceptually at least from what you've figured out. Uh, and they might even you know, make, have improvements for it. So this sort of iterative process where things just get better in, you know, in, you know there's this process that repeats of, uh, of ideas coming up and the, and the concept getting better it's going to continue with other people chiming in on uh, on that dialogue. And so, but if it is actually a folio idea that you've come up with, uh, you what what we've done right now is we've created a tag on the folio uh, forum, uh, the, the discuss.folio.org, uh, where you can uh, just tag it with um, folio-future, and then all the new ideas for things that might be interesting to build for Folio is sort of locked there. And then if, if a developer has some time and they want to help out with something, you know, they might join and help build whatever it is. Or if we are working on a functionality in one of the core teams that relate to this, we might try to integrate with what is what is being posted. Um, it's basically just to get, you know, everyone talking about the good ideas and see what we can do in that arena. So, so just to recap, uh, the process looks like this, you know, you spot a problem, figure out what's actually causing the problem, ask why a bunch of times, write down your ideas, uh, all the crazy ones and all the good ones and all the bad ones, pick out one or more and, and try and turn it into something tangible, uh, test it and talk to people about it and then either fix it or, or ditch it. Um, and as you can see, the arrows go, <laughs> a hundred directions in this because it's not, it is an iterative process. It's not like a thing where you take it from A to C and then that's the way it works. Uh, it's, it is very organic in a way. Um, and so, yeah. And when you get to a point where you think it makes sense to share it, um, you can share it. I mean, even testing the solution, a part of that could be just putting it out, uh, testing it online by putting it out on, Folio forum, it's a folio idea or put or putting out a, a blog post or something before that. Uh, if anyone wants to sort of read more about these uh, principles, these are some books that, that I would um, recommend. And all of the all of the sort of methods and principles that I mentioned, like user story mapping and brainstorming and mind mapping, you can just uh, search for it online or in the library catalog and books or videos and articles will show up. Um, and I think that's, that's the presentation. Um, but so I think I spend enough time on this that we should probably jump to the questions at this point. Um, I hope it made some sense to you guys. I didn't, isn't a super polished presentation, but just like the process itself, uh, I hope, hope it makes sense. Great. Uh, thanks, Philip. Uh, I wanted to uh, uh, note there towards the end of your presentation, uh, those uh, uh, pictures of the post-it notes uh, came from a folio gathering in Australia uh, early this month. So uh, if uh, you're planning your own folio get together and, and you start uh, brainstorming uh, ideas that uh, you would like to take folio in, uh, by all means, uh, capture those and and share those more broadly. Uh, so we are at the uh, time for questions and answers, and uh, I encourage you to uh, put your questions uh, into the Q&A box. Uh, and again, also indicate uh, if you have the capability of, uh, of uh, asking those uh, directly to fill up uh, with a microphone. Uh, 
one question I had, Philip, uh, is how, in, in the course of, of brainstorming, uh, I imagine that you come up with, with dozens of ideas uh, of things that you could tackle. Um, how do you pick the first one or the first few ones uh, to, to work on? Uh, well, you don't, at least not right when you're doing it, because as soon as there's sort of a bar for what you're allowed to suggest, people start moderating themselves, and that's not what, what uh, is supposed to happen at this stage, because then almost no ideas will come up. Um, but afterwards, when you start sorting them, like I showed here, um, it, it will become evident this is what often happens, at least, is that sort of a lot of the ideas and the nuances of the different ideas, they sort of overlap into these and form these clusters. And so that idea category A becomes sort of one thing to look at. Uh, there are different methods you can use, like um, you could you can do this thing where you have some little uh, stickers that you use to vote for the different ideas, uh, so everyone can sort of... Uh, recommend what they think you should continue with. Um, but it depends a little on the setup, which people are in the brainstorm and who who actually has the, who should have a say in, in what goes forward. Um, so yeah, I think it depends a lot on the on the context, but, but, um, but usually it won't be like, you know, it won't be a hundred different ideas. It might be, you know, 10 different ideas that everyone can kind of see this is some, there is something here. Um, mm. And it's it's a matter of priority and and uh, politics, I guess, as it always is. <laughs> as to where you go from there, yeah. Right. Uh, there was one question uh, in the the uh, chat, and and again, we're uh, to to have these uh, recorded and seen uh, by everyone. I do encourage people to use uh, the Q and A box, uh, but there's a, a a kind of a broader question. Uh, about uh, how to uh, uh, get folio uh, going in other parts of the globe. Uh, and uh, that's certainly something that uh, within the community, uh, we look to uh, uh, have meetups or uh, uh, different organizations that uh, that uh, host a gathering of people interested in folio, uh, and then uh, uh, in some cases they do their own research and presentation. Uh, in other cases, uh, uh, they invite members from the folio uh, community to come in and, and talk about uh, folio. Uh, do you have any thoughts about um, uh, how we can uh, uh, spread uh, the interest of, of folio to uh, uh, regions where it's not there is we might do some brainstorming here maybe. Oh, right. Um, well, I think um, if it relates to sort of people wanting to get involved with with this sort of stuff, UX and brainstorming and so on, um, there is uh, there is a chance to join in with the SIG meetings, of course, and on discuss because we post all the all the new stuff on there to have the discussions there. And there's also the chance uh, to translate this, the materials we do to a different language so that we can have a dialogue about the specific use cases in a given region of the world. Um, on a more strategic level, if someone wants to start up. Uh, a folio community somewhere that's probably more you than me who would know about that but uh, get in touch with me i can i right. can certainly help with those kinds of things um yeah translation is is a good example of where there doesn't need to be a, a technical expertise right uh you've had the uh the ux interface uh, uh translated to a couple different languages uh what does that entail uh, so that's basically you get a login to an online platform where you go in and translate a bunch of little pieces of text in the interfaces and then you can download some videos and record a voiceover in a, in the the other language and then upload them again so it's it's quite simple technically it's quite simple of course not talking about uh, developers here uh, uh, yeah great um, 
other questions uh, from the the audience? I'll just uh, uh, pause here for a moment uh, to to see if any uh, come in. You know, something, Philip, that, that uh, I'm curious about, uh, you know, you and I have, have uh, worked together uh, for a, a little while now on this project. Um, just maybe out of curiosity, how, how do, uh, uh, as you work through other uh, fields and other industries, um, how do librarians compare, how, how does this project compare uh, to the other work that you've done? Um, has, it, has it been more difficult to uh, uh, figure out uh, what it is that we're doing or uh, uh, has it been easier to, to help us work through some of our user experience issues? Um, I think it's in terms of complexity for the design process, it's the same. There's, it's not more or less difficult than something else. Um, it, because if you're a developer and you need to build a product that scales, you need to consider a bunch of stuff. But if you're a UX designer, uh, you, you just, it doesn't matter if the system is going to be used by a million people or by, by one person. Um, you just need to make it work for that one person using the system at, at a given time. Um, what I have found with librarians is that because you guys are uh, trained in information architecture, uh, you, can, you can do a lot of the stuff that I usually sort of have to walk people through and hold their hand more, mm, uh, mm. which is great. Like, so, so the, some of the workshops we've had, it's, it's definitely evident that uh, if you just, when I just tell people what to do, then they, they take it from there. So in mm. that way, it's a luxury to work in, in the library field. I imagine every field has its own uh, jargon and its, its uh, own uh, history and how it's uh, done things. So uh, uh, from that perspective, as I guess, as you were saying, uh, we're, we're no different. Uh, our jargon is just as dense as, as anyone else's. That's your words, not mine, but... Uh... <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, we have a, a one question that's come in. Uh, do you have a, a favorite uh, graphical idea development method? Uh, this person says, uh, in searching for information about mind mapping, uh, he's not found any methods that he likes very much. Uh, any recommended sources for info uh, besides the... the references you listed uh, at the end so of your presentation? I'm not sure, John, if you're asking about, it's John Fullerton? Yes. Right. Um, uh, not sure if, uh, if the question is about tools to use or if it's, um, if it's about the concept of mind mapping. If it's tools, I have a tool I like to use that's called ExoBrain. And it's actually discontinued, so it doesn't have a lot of features. But I like mm. it because it's so simple. I'll just send the um, send the link in the chat. If I can do that. Uh, in terms of um, graphical idea development, um, yeah, I'm I'm not sure if, if what how to interpret that. Uh, John, if you do have a uh, oh, you're in a, a group meeting, and so you have your speaker off. Okay. Um, yeah, if, uh, if you can uh, put in uh, tools and uh, graphic display of the work. Ah, interesting. Um, right. So, so that's, the, that's my favorite tool for brainstorming, or for mind mapping, sorry. Um, and um, for displaying the work, I mean, I usually just grab a screenshot, so screenshot of what I'm doing. Um, mm. But it, it depends a lot. So this is where it gets a bit, um, just like if you're a librarian, you sort of have an in intuitive gut feeling about probably how to catalog something or how to, where to find information in a certain way. And when you work with user interfaces, I'll determine based on the information at hand, what's the best way to visualize it going forward from there. The mind map works for most things, just like the user story map. 
But whether you turn that then into a diagram or a user interface or something else, uh, there's no wrong way to do it. It's just the more you do it, the better a feel you have for sort of which tools work for which types of data. Um, yeah, he goes on to say the, the graphical style. And, and so that makes me wonder if, if there's uh, uh, conventions of, of node shapes or arrows or oh, uh, so formats or colors or things like that that uh, uh, help you uh, in, in really kind of displaying this. Uh, so the tool I mentioned, it's, it automatically gives different colors to different branches, which is it's, it's one of the best sort of uh, distinct uh, things to distinguish different types of data is, is color. Um, in terms of if you're doing like a flow map, you know, if this happens, then do go this way and so on. There are some established uh, symbols. When you do a mind map, there aren't any really ru rules because uh, you have digital tools, but they're all just trying to mimic what you do on a whiteboard or on a piece of mm. paper. Mm. So I, st I mean, a piece of paper is is the best. It's just it's it's a lot of paper to carry around if if you do a lot of mind maps. So I prefer sometimes to use the digital tools. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, any other questions uh, for Philip? I'm not seeing any. So, Philip, unless you have any uh, closing thoughts, um, we'll call. We'll bring this one to a close. Right. No, no other thoughts than uh, if you have any any questions after the the meeting, you can just get in touch with me on Discuss or somewhere else. Wonderful. Yeah. Please do it uh, on Discuss uh, so that we can all share. Uh, in in both the question uh, and the answer and and. Uh, uh, do our own bit of, of brainstorming there. Uh, so this uh, concludes today's Folio Forum on how to invent things that meet challenges in libraries. Uh, as we were just talking about, you can continue the conversation uh, on the Folio Discussion website. Uh, that's discuss.folio.org. Uh, and on Twitter using the hashtag Folio Forum. Uh, the recording of today's forum will be posted soon to the openlibraryenvironment.org website. Uh, if you have any feedback on this forum or uh, have an idea for a future forum, uh, please contact the uh, forum facilitators at facilitators at olay-lists.openlibraryfoundation.org. Uh, and please join me in thanking Philip for leading this through leading us through this topic and everyone else who asked questions and added comments. Uh, thank you very much. Have a great day. Thanks. See you guys. <laughs>